Okay, so we have here uh, Joseph Eisner to talk about operators with control support expansion from University of Virginia. Uh, thanks for coming, Joe, and go for it. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, okay, yeah, so we're gonna, I'll define what support expansion is, and then we'll talk about different ways to control it, and this will give us some classes of uh, operator algebras. Um, and the, this is the rough talk, this is the rough schedule for today. I'm gonna start talking about um, a thing called matrix finite operators, which is a pretty accessible, uh, it, this is how we started. We looked at this paper by Vladimir Manulov, and uh, he introduces matrix finite operators, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then th this is what has inspired us to define support expansion. And then so once we've introduced these operators, we'll talk about support expansion kind of in a discrete setting, get some C-star algebras, and then we'll move to a uh, continuous setting, a measurable setting, and, uh, and do the same thing there. And then the, these two cases will be highly contrastable. They'll be very different. Um, okay, so matrix finite operators. Um, so think about operators just on little l2 and associate them with their matrices. So just think about them as, as the array. And then we can say a, a, an operator is matrix finite if you can find some parameter n so that every row and column of your, of your operator has at most in non-zero entries, and most in non-zero entries per row, at least in non-zero entries per column. If you can do that, if you can find such a parameter, such a finite number, then the, ma the operator is matrix finite. And so here's just an example, uh, supposing that maybe you fill in the rest of this with zeros. This operator is matrix finite with, um, with parameter three. So there's at most two non-zero entries per row, but there's at most three non-zero entries per column. And this first column is the, the defender where you need the parameter to be three. Okay. And then um, if, you, if you consider such operators, take the collection, um, it, it turns out you get a star algebra. And so some of this is easy to see. Um, I think a scalar multiplication is, is clear. That's not gonna change the number of non-zero entries unless the scalar is zero, in which case it it just kills kills everything. Um, addition, if I have at most n non-zero entries per row and you have at most say, k non-zero entries per row, then we may overlap or we may cancel in some places, but we're not going to generate more than some, somehow generate more than n plus k non-zero entries per row. And, and then um, it's closed under adjoints because that's kind of baked into the definition by specifying row and column. So, so I think these three are kind of easy to see. You don't necessarily need to write out a proof or anything. Um, seeing that these operators are closed under multiplication is a little bit tougher. Um, and you can prove this, you can prove this algebraically. You can just go through the algebra and show that uh, it's, kind of, it's multiplicative. If you have an operator with the most n non-zero entries per row and column and an operator with k non-zero entries per row and column, you multiply them, it'll be nk at most n k non-zero entries per own column. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's not a pretty proof. The algebra is messy. And so the way I want to argue this for you guys is to kind of give an alternative definition for matrix finite that will make the closure under multiplication clear. So if you think about, um, it, let's just look at the column condition for a minute. So, so by specifying that you want at most n non-zero entries per column, what you could do is you could interpret that as, um, it, think of the column vectors as the output of the basis vectors. So if, if you feed a basis vector to your operator, you get a column vector corresponding to each element. And if you think of the basis vectors as support one vectors, then what you're saying is that you want to expand support one vectors to at most support n vectors by, by having at most n non-zero entries per column. Um, and, and that actually gives you an immediate condition on, on all, of, all support expansion. So if you had a support two vector, you had two non, you had your coefficient on basis elements, two of them were non-zero. Um, then you'd have at most two n non-zero entries um, per two columns. Uh, so it's a little hard, but, but so uh, you get an immediate bound on expansion. So, so it, what we're sort of thinking of is how many non-zero rows can you get with, 
with a given number of columns. And so the given number of columns, you're talking about what's the support of your input vector, what's the size of the support, and then what's the maximum support of your output vector would be how many non-zero rows you could get. Um, so th this is a different way of thinking about matrix finite operators, but it, it, it is equivalent. Um, and so what we can do is we can just specify, uh, we can say an operator is matrix finite if you can find a parameter in so that uh, the support of the output is at most n times the support of the input for any input vector for, for every possible vector you could plug in. And then if you insist the same thing for the adjoint, that gives you your row condition. So most n non-zero entries per row. And once you've defined it this, once you've defined matrix finite this way, the closure under multiplication is, is a lot easier to see because if, if the first operator expands support by a factor of n, the second operator expands support by a factor of at most k, then together they'll expand support by a factor of most n times k. And so we then see that matrix finite operators are a star algebra, star subalgebra of B of L2. Um, and, and then if you close them up, you would get a C star algebra, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, but now that we've kind of rephrased this notion of matrix finite in terms of support expansion, there's other ways that support can be expanded. It, it doesn't have to be some linear factor, right? Not, not all operators are gonna expand things by linear factors. Now here we're saying at most some linear factor, but I wanna dig into that and just see what, what are some different ways that support could, could be expanded. So, if, so, so we define this sequence for a given Operator, you can define a sequence which captures its support expansion. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at vectors that have support at most the index that you're interested in. You're gonna run them through your operator and then measure the support of what comes out. And, and you'll take the supremum over all vectors with a given support or less. And then whatever that supremum is, you put a point there on your graph. And so let me just talk through this real quick. This is only interested in columns, the, by the way, this definition. We'll, we'll capture the rows by looking at adjoints. Um, and so, for instance, if I wanted to know the support expansion sequence of this operator, if I wanted to know what the value was at one, I would, I would plug in basis vectors, which would, which would pull out column vectors. And so I'd be looking at each column and I'd say, what's the maximum number of non-zero entries per column? Or, or maybe more generally, what's the maximum number of non-zero rows that I can get with one column? And you see it's three. There's, these have two, and this one has one, but this one has three, so that's the maximum, the supremum. And so there's a point there at three. Okay. And then for the index of two, we'd be asking a basis, you'd be putting in a vector with, with two basis elements, um, a vector with two basis components that are non-zero. And, uh, and so that would be looking at two columns at a time. And I'm not so much worried about if there's cancellation or overlap. I, we're, we're allowing the, uh, we're looking at all vectors with two basis components with a support of size two. So, so you're asking with two columns, what's the largest number of non-zero rows you can get? Okay. Um, and you see there's lots of ways to get four. I could take the first and second column and I get four non-zero rows here. Or I could take the first and the third column and I get, there's three and then here's the fourth one down here. Um, and then for three, we'd be taking three columns. What's the biggest number of non-zero rows you can get? In this case, there's only one way to get six. And that would be to take columns two, three, and four. And then you see you get six non-zero rows, all six of them. Um, Notably, this doesn't involve taking the first column, which was the, originally it was like the maximum, right? When we looked at index one, the first column was the, the, the greedy algorithm would take the first column first. And that won't get you to six on index three. And so a consequence of this is that these support expansion sequences don't have to be concave down, um, which is kind of interesting. Our, our first intuition was that you should use this greedy algorithm. And so you would think these should be concave down, but, but you can see from this example, that's not the case. Um, the sequences do have to be increasing because you're taking supremums over larger sets, but, uh, but they don't have to, well, non-decreasing, but they don't have to be concave down. Um, 
And then so, but, but here's some properties they have to satisfy. So of course, the only support zero vector is zero. So these support expansion sequences have to be zero at zero. They have to be non-decreasing, as we discussed. Um, this last condition, because, um, because supports only take on positive integer values in little l, little l infinity or little l2 here, um, you can't have slopes less than one. And, and so uh, once, once you end up, once, you, once you're flat, once one of these sequences is flat, it has to stay flat. Because that's like saying, I couldn't find any additional non-zero rows. And once you can't find any additional ones, you'd never be able to find additional ones. So once these are flat, they stay flat. Um, and then this, this is non-trivial, but this is kind of the stand-in for concave down. Um, so if you, if you draw a line from the origin to any point on the graph, then the slope of those lines has to be uh, non-increasing. So I, I, maybe I should say like slope to origin non-increasing. Um, and you can see that here. So the slope from zero to one is three. The slope from zero to two here is two. Four over two is two. And then from zero to, to three here is still two. So that, that did not go up. Even though we failed to be concave down, we we're still slope to the origin, non-increasing. Um, and so these are the properties uh, all support expansion sequences have to satisfy. Um, and then support expansion sequences play really nice. And you kind of saw this with the matrix finite operators. They play nice with, um, with algebra operations. Um, so if you, if you, right, so scalar multiples don't, don't really change support expansion unless the scalar is zero, in which case it just kills it. Um, they're sub-additive and they, 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 they are sub-multiplicative if, if the multiplication on sequences is composition. And it might seem weird to compose sequences, but, but these, are, these are all positive integer valued sequences um, because they're supports and supports are positive integer valued. So, so this composition does make sense. Um, and so support expansion sequences play nicely with, with the underlying algebra operations, scalar multiplication, addition, and, and multiplication. Um, and so I want to work towards building a C star algebra using, using these notions. And so to do that, I'm going to have to start like collecting operators. And so what I'm going to do is if you, if you hand me a condition sequence, which is just some sequence, uh, some natural number valued sequence, if you hand me that, I can hand you back all the operators whose support expansion sequence is dominated by the sequence you hand me. Um, I'm also going to require that the, the support expansion sequence of their adjoint be dominated. And that's what's going to give us, um, will be closed under star later. And so, so right, so, and this is just a collection of operators. This, this collection has no nice closure properties. It's not closed under addition or anything like that. But here's a collection of operators. Um, and if you hand me a sequence, I can, I can give you a bunch of operators back. Um, and so this is our operator from earlier, our support expansion sequence from earlier. And then here, the green and red lines are, are some condition sequences that you might have handed me. And so um, I could say here, for instance, that A0 is inside of B sub 3n because, because the sequence is completely dominated. So is the adjoint sequence, which I didn't put here, but it is also dominated. And then, but you could say, for instance, that A0 is not contained in B sub 2n uh, because of this point here. So that's just how that works. So, so everything's dominated. Um, oh, I should clear that before I move on. And then these collections of operators themselves are not closed under any, any nice algebra operations, but, uh, but they are compatible with the algebra operations and they inherit this from the support expansion sequences. So uh, uh, one of these collections is closed under scalar multiplication. If you have two collections and you add any operators from, from each of them, they'll be closed under the, the, they'll be inside of the collection of operators that are controlled by S plus T. Similarly, if you multiply two operators here and here, you'll get something controlled by S composed T. And these are closed under star because that's baked into the definition by, by putting the condition on the adjoint as well, closed under star. So, 
we don't have an algebra yet, but you see how if we if we had a, maybe instead of one sequence, if we had like a nice family of sequences, we could get a star a star algebra. And and so that's the content of this slide. We observe that um, if you have a family of sequences that's closed under addition and composition, so these should be natural number valued sequences, um, then then if you look at all operators whose support expansion is controlled by some member of that family, and you, you union this up over the whole family, you should have a star algebra. That's, that's the content of, of the previous slide. And, and then if you close it up in the norm topology, you'll get a C star algebra. And so this is a way if you hand me a, a family of sequences, I can hand you a C star algebra back, okay, as long as the family is closed under addition and composition. Um, and then, and then a lot of times we're actually only interested in, in some generator of the family. So if you hand me a sequence, maybe I run on my side, I, I find the smallest family that's closed under addition and composition that contains S, and then I use that family to generate the C star algebra. So I could, I, could, I could write B sub bracket S, and then you can think of this somehow as a C star algebra that just came from one sequence. You handed me a sequence, I gave you a C star algebra. Um, and so it, if you if you run this procedure with the initial sequence just being in, um, so, so that's basically that's the line through the origin with slope one and this the family that would generate would be all the lines through the origin with positive integer slope and then you you took everyone whose support expansion was dominated by that and their adjoints was as well, and, and then you did this procedure, you'd get a C star algebra B sub bracket in. Um, and it turns out this is an interesting C star algebra. And th this is the C star algebra of matrix finite bounded operators. So we, we've done a kind of a complicated construction to recover uh, what Manulov did in his paper that motivated all of this. Um, so th this is a novel C star algebra. I mean, not completely novel, but, but relatively new. Um, it's it's smaller than the bounded operators. It's bigger than the compacts. It has a unique maximal ideal that's bigger than the compacts. And there's a lot of other interesting properties uh, that Manulov proves about this algebra in his paper. Now, the, this algebra in particular is not is not the focus of this talk. It's more this construction and how can we generalize the construction. So I'm not I'm not going to go into all the properties. But we saw uh, our, uh, the narrative we're walking through is we see you can get an interesting C star algebra this way. And so we're curious, can you get others? If, if instead of using in here, if I use some other initial sequence, could I have gotten a different interesting C star algebra? Um, so that's our question. And the answer is no. <laughs> For in, in this setting, in the discrete setting, that's the only interesting C star algebra, the only novel one that you get. There, you can get some other ones, um, but they're, they're very familiar. And, and you'll see in a second when I go to the next slide, there's only four C star algebras you can get through this procedure in the discrete setting. Okay. And here they are. Oh, let me scroll down a little. So the four algebras you can get are the zero C star algebra, the compacts, B sub bracket N. Which, which has been studied, and uh, and and the entire, all, all the bounded operators. Um, so if you use the zero sequence, obviously the only operator that that itself is a family closed under addition and composition, and the only operator in there is the zero operator. And this is this is pretty much the only way to get zero. Um, maybe jumping down here, if 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 you have a sequence in your family that's just infinity all the way across, that's not a condition at all. And so every operator, if you hand it a vector, it, the output will have at most infinite support, right? That's, that's not a condition at all. Every operator satisfies that. And so this is actually everything, even before you take the norm closure. It's just, you just get everything here. Um, and then if your family consists of sequences that are eventually flat, so you don't have anyone in your family and your family of sequences who can go to infinity, um, then you'll get the compacts because it, it, it turns out, if you think about what this means, because this condition is being applied to both the rows and the columns, this would be saying there's actually at most, at most finitely many non-zero entries at all. Like not just per row or per column, but in the whole matrix, um, if you're eventually flat. 
and then and then so if you took the span of that you get the finite rank operators and and then if you close that up you get the compacts so any any family of sequences that doesn't have anything going to whose limit is infinity at infinity will give you the compacts um, as long as it's not just zero and and um, and then anything that any family that does have things tending to infinity at infinity but does not have these anyone who attains infinity uh, will give you B sub bracket n and that's just because you could you could always um, you could always take like some multiple of one sequence to dominate the other. So if you have any two sequences that go to infinity at infinity, you could just multiply one of them by a large enough number to dominate the other sequence. And so starting with bracket n or starting with some other sequence that tends to infinity, um, they're, they're going to mutually dominate each other. And so all the operators that they dominate or some member of their generated family dominates, uh, it's all the same operators. And so when you close up, of course, you get the same C star algebra. Uh, and so in the discrete setting, this is it. This is all you get. Um, and this is the only novel C star algebra you see. Okay. And so if th that's, that's not much of a story. But uh, we realize that all the tools we're using to do this have analogs. So um, instead of working in little L2, we could work in big L2, say of maybe perhaps a, a non-atomic, maybe finite measure space, uh, measure space, um, because that would sort of be the, the alternate extreme. Instead of having all atoms and infinitely many, you have a finite non-atomic space. Um, we'll take supports in big L infinity, so projections, you know, the characteristic functions, projections in big L infinity instead of little L infinity. And then we'll measure the size of the projections with the underlying measure instead of the cardinality. Okay. And then we'll, we'll do the exact same construction. Right? So from here, a lot of the definitions will be the same. Uh, but but the, uh, the realities will be a little bit different. So, so here we'll define support expansion functions. And this is essentially the same definition you saw earlier with sequences. Um, the difference is our supports can take on values other than positive integers now. So these do have to be functions and not sequences, um, which you see here. And then we'll look at all vectors with a support size smaller than the M, smaller than T, run them through the operator, and look at the supports that come out and what size are they. And if you take the supremum, then, then that's the point, that's the Y value at a given point T. Um, and we'll call this the support expansion function of the operator. Okay. And then I'm just going to work a couple of examples. Um, and so, so here's an operator. I'm, I'm on the unit interval with Lebesgue measure. And this is a comp, this is a weighted composition operator. And I'm going to implore you to kind of disregard the weight. I, I put the weights there because I want to make sure everything's bounded. And so I just went ahead and made them unitaries. But the, the weight's not really the focus here. You, you really want to know how does, how does this operator move supports around? And it's a composition operator, so, so it moves supports around kind of by the inverse of this function. Um, and so what you're going to see, you know, if, if, if I draw x squared here, if I give you a characteristic function like pi of 0, 1 half, and I, I run it through this operator, I'm going to get chi of 0, 1 fourth. And then, and then some weight here, which I'm saying, don't, don't worry about the weight, because we're taking supports anyway. So the weight isn't what's important. What's important is this characteristic piece. Um, and you see it, it took 0, 1 half and turned it to 0, 1 fourth. So it's, it's kind of behaving like x squared would. It's, it's compressing things that are near the origin. And you, you can see that, right? Like if I, if, I took, if I took some interval near the origin, it definitely gets compressed when you, when you like send this to its corresponding y value, right? Here's something. You can see that the length of this interval is, is much bigger than the length of that interval. Um, and so if you wanted maximum support expansion for this operator, you wouldn't be plugging in characteristic functions or, or, or anything actually with support on the left of the interval. You'd be plugging in things on the right of the interval. So you might plug in something instead. You might plug in 1 half 1. And you see this gets, this gets blown up, right? This gets turned into chi of 1 fourth 1. And so that's, you're achieving maximum support expansion kind of on the right-hand side of the interval. And so because of that, 
the support expansion function you see here does not match. It doesn't look like x squared, right? Because because you kind of what you want to read here is read x squared backwards. That's what that one minus t is, and then flip it backwards again. Kind of that, that's sort of what you're seeing here, and so that's that's the support expansion function for x squared. Um, I mean, well, for this operator, but I'm associating in my mind this operator kind of acts like x squared. Um, hope, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, okay, and then I want to contrast this with the situation if I do, I'm going to look at another weighted composition operator where this guy should act like square root of x. Um, and since square root of x is concave down, you do have that the uh, the optimal way, if, if you want to see the biggest support expansion, you should plug in things on the left. You should plug in characteristic functions that abut 0, right? 0, 1 fourth, right? This is going to get mapped to chi of 0, 1 half. Sorry for my handwriting here. And then some weight. Um, so since maximum maximum expansion is being realized by by supports hugged against the right hand side of this interval, that's the way square root of x is read. It's read left left to right, and so the support expansion function of this operator is square root of x, square root of t. Okay. Um, and so what's what's the what, I'm curious. Like that's that's very interesting to me because that's sort of what I would have expected it to be. When, it, when I see this operator, once I've thought about it a while, I think of this like it acts like square root of x, and that's the support expansion function you get. And so I'd like to get more of that. I'd like to be able to easily be able to know the support expansion function of something, or alternatively, if I want to achieve a certain uh, support expansion function, can I build an operator that does that? So we saw for, for x squared, that wasn't happening. But for square root of x, it was. Um, and so there's a theorem here, or a, a lemma, I guess, that if the function you're interested in is increasing and concave down, then it is very easy to find an operator that realizes it as a support expansion operator, and, and it's, it's, it's this. So you compose with the inverse of your function. So you do actually need it to be properly increasing, not just not decreasing, for, for both for the inverse to make sense and for the, um, the derivative. To, to make sense here. But, and again, this weight is just to make sure it's bounded, so I can make it a unitary. Um, all right, so, so if you're concave down, it's easy to realize you as a support expansion function. Um, and then, so the question maybe is, is that all of the support, are all support expansion functions concave down? Because they, they weren't in the discrete case, right? We, we saw that you could have support expansion sequences that were not concave down. And that's still true here. You, 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 can, you can realize support expansion functions that are not concave down. You just can't do it, as far as I know, with a single composition operator. You might need some infinite sum of composition operators or something, but it, it can be done. Um, and, and so this, this list of criteria characterizes the support expansion functions on little l2 of the interval. Um, and in fact, probably non-atomic spaces in general. So it's the same conditions, most of the same conditions we had before. You have to be zero at zero, non-decreasing, and slope to the origin, non-increasing. So here's an example. This is not a special function by any means. It's just it, it demonstrates that you don't have to be concave down. The, this function is a support expansion function. It satisfies these criteria, but it clearly is not concave down. Go ahead and clear annotations. Okay, so so we've characterized the support expansion functions, and then we're going to want to run kind of the same. Oops, we're going to run the same construction we did before, and try and get some C star algebras. Um, so, by all the same arguments, you're just replacing absolute value with with mu and and um, the, these things are compatible with the underlying algebra operations. Um, and then, so what you can do is for any given condition function, you can take all the operators who support expansion and the support expansion of their adjoint are dominated by said function. And if you do that, the resulting collections you get will inherit the compatibility with the algebra operations. 
Um, just like they did in the discrete case, there's, there's not really any new content here. You just copy the proofs and, and change out absolute values for mu's. And, um, yeah. and then you construct C star algebras uh, by, by taking a family of functions that's closed under addition and composition, looking at anything dominated in this support expansion sense by any member of that family, and then closing it up in the norm topology you get C star algebra, and then still we'll be interested in these singly generated ones. So take a take a function, generate the family, and then generate the C star algebra. Um, and so when we do this, a uh, little bit of a spoiler, we're, we're not just going to get one interesting C star algebra. In the, in the continuous setting, we're actually going to get a, a ton. We're going it, to, it's a very rich structure. And um, the reason, here's, here's a couple of reasons for that. So what's different in the continuous setting from the discrete setting? Um, one is if, if, say you have an infinite measure non-atomic space, then um, because of the slope non-increasing property and the fact that in the discrete setting supports have to be positive integer valued, you, you can't really go to infinity in very many ways in the discrete setting. You can basically go linear. You can go to infinity like a line or maybe a line with slope two or a line, but, but it's always linear. Um, and then in the continuous setting, we now have supports that are less than size one. And so we can approach infinity slower than linear. And, and so we can approach infinity a lot of different ways because of that. So we can approach infinity like square root of X does. Um, and and there's, there's actually a ton of different ways to approach infinity. And so that, that opens up a way to separate out and get different C star algebras. Um, and then, I like to work on the interval, so I don't have that concern, but you always have this issue where, um, where you can now approach zero, where in the discrete setting you couldn't. You just had a point at zero and a point at one. In the continuous setting, you can approach zero. Well, you can never go faster than linear. You can't approach zero like say x squared because of this, this slope, this slope non-increasing property that prevents you from going to zero like too fast, but you can approach zero slow like square root of x does. And then there's lots of different ways to do that. You can, you can even like have two different functions kind of crisscrossing each other as they go to zero. And so there's like, there's lots of different ways to approach zero and that gives you a lot of C star algebras. Um, and so at least on the interval, the way you can explore this and you can, you can start examining just how many different C star algebras you can get is, is with the following theorem, um, which kind of does all the, all the work uh, so, but it's a little hard to, to digest. So if we're looking at the interval and you have two condition functions f and g, supposing they, they satisfy the, the given conditions, um, then you can say b of f, b sub bracket f is as a C star algebra is not a subset of b sub bracket g if and only if for every compositional power of g, you can find some sequence going to zero on which, on which f dominates that compositional power of g in, in this sense. Uh, so th it's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's also very powerful. So that's kind of what you're paying for with it not being a, a simple to state theorem, is it, it can do all kinds of things. Um, so something to really point out here is, is, is the sequence is chosen after the compositional power. And so that's what, because of that, you're going to be able to have like two functions going to zero, kind of crisscrossing, each dominating each other's powers. So dominating each other in this very strong sense. And, and so you can end up getting like non-comparable C star algebras this way. Um, yeah, so this theorem does the, does the work. It basically says you don't have to think about C star algebras anymore. You're now just doing function theory because this theorem does all, does the splitting and, and generating different C star algebras. Okay. And then so there's a lot of work between this slide and the next slide, but you can do a bunch of function theory. And, and here's some characteristics of the resulting post set of C star algebras that you get. Um, so you can, you can have uncountable height chains. So it's a nested C star algebras that are uncountably tall, um, proper, proper containments. You can have um, uncountable width anti-chains, so, so uncountable lists of pairwise um, non-comparable C star algebras you can get out of this procedure. And um, at least for the singly 
singly generated ones, and, and with the exception of this, what you see here on the, on the board, um, you won't have successors. So between any two singly generated C star algebras, except these two, uh, you, you'll be able to find a distinct separating C star algebra that is equal to neither of the two you hand in. Um, and so this is the lattice. It's extremely rich, right? Uncountable height, uncountable width, no successors. Um, and this should be contrasted with the four point lattice we had uh, in the discrete setting. So where we just had B of L2, um, B sub bracket N, K, and zero. Uh, okay. And then the, this, this F naught is, is just all functions that actually approach zero as you go to zero, because you they don't the the slope non decreasing thing slope non increasing property doesn't force you to do that. You could actually just be discontinuous at zero, and um, but that'll give you if you do that you'll get everything. Uh, so. Um, quick question. Yeah. Um, so if instead of asking about containment, you ask if there's like an injective homomorphism from one to the other, do you do you have like similar results? Uh, no, not. I don't have much um, okay. in the way of, of like isom isomorphism classes or anything like that. Yeah, I was just wondering if somehow you can say for if you have two functions and they're like they're they're have very different rates of growth or or, or whatever, then then uh, you can't even embed one into the other. I, anyway, right, yeah. right. So the, this would be a really good result to have, um, and it's it's kind of on the to do list, um, but sure. we don't have anything yet. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I have some thoughts on it, but, but uh, I don't have anything solid, so I probably shouldn't say anything. Um, okay, great. And so, so that's kind of the end of, of, of the, this chapter. This is some, what you can do with support expansion and, and what we've done. And, and so in the measurable setting, um, you get a ton of C star algebras and hopefully there's different isomorphism classes. Maybe it's, it's not, not sure yet. Um, and maybe they have interesting properties, you know, kind of like B sub bracket N did. Okay. Um, but in doing this, um, uh, in going through this, we've also kind of, we, we see a lot of a very broad, broad um, sprawling theory that I kind of want to talk just a little bit about as well, that, that everything I've talked about up to now kind of slots nicely into. Um, so it was mentioned on a slide, but I don't think I said it verbally. That B sub bracket n is a is a uniform row algebra, and so these are C star algebras that are generated from coarse structures, which you could think of a coarse structure as a, a generalization of a metric. Um, and so, and, and in fact, B sub bracket n is is clearly a row algebra from its construction. It's not like some obscure isomorphism that tells you it is. Um, it clearly is, and so all of these algebras that we're building in the in the continuous setting or the measurable setting, you could think of them as, as some kind of very, as, as some kind of analog of B sub bracket N, right? The, the this notion just splits into this huge lattice or this huge post set of, of C star algebras. But it would be nice if they could be realized somehow in an obvious way as uniform row algebras. Um, and in order to do this, you would need to have some notion of, of measurable uniform row algebras. And um, as far as we saw, this didn't exist. And so we, we developed it. Um, Braga, Sherman, and I have been developing a notion of, of measurable uniform row algebra from measurable core structures. And this all hinges on a very interesting theory by Nick Weaver, his theory on measurable relations, which came up last week, of course. Um, and this is definitely worth looking at and this this turned out to be the exact tool we needed so it, it's kind of hard to talk about what a relation what a measurable relation would be I mean, that's what we needed um, and we were kind of bumping around and hitting some of the right ideas but it probably would have taken a long time but but uh, Nick Weaver's already done that he's already he's already described measurable relations in kind of the perfect way the right way and so you can you can define measurable row algebras and indeed all of the ones I've constructed here do slot nicely in as examples of measurable row algebras. Um, Nick Weaver went on, he kind of just did measurable relations on the way to doing quantum relations in a, in a non-commutative sense. He defines a non-commutative analog for relations. Um, and so 
there would be a natural notion of, of quantum core structures and thus quantum uniform row algebras and, um, and perhaps quantum support expand, expansion C star algebras that would slot in nicely there. Um, and we're sort of still in the process of this. Um, there's other people in the room who could explain it better than I could, but, but I have some, I could definitely say some about it. Um, yeah, and so, so all of this, everything I've talked about with these support ex controlled support expansion operators is kind of just, just, just one little outcropping of trees in a much bigger forest. Um, uh, and so, so here, oh, okay, I'll get to that in a second. So, so here I just, I kind of describe how you would go about talking about support expansion in a non-commutative setting. Um, so instead of taking operators on B of L2 or something, you, you could, you could potentially work maybe any, maybe just any B sub H, B of H, or maybe even just in any von Neumann algebra at all. Um, you would take supports perhaps from a massa, like little L infinity and big L infinity or massas, or, or perhaps not a massa, perhaps some other abelian sub von Neumann algebra, or perhaps not even abelian, perhaps you just take some sub, sub von Neumann algebra. And then you need some way to measure the supports. Well, the supports are projections, so you need some way of measuring projections. Um, but we, those things that you have dimension functions and maybe, maybe you take restricted traces. And so some of these, perhaps this, perhaps this is, are kind of, um, maybe like mutually disjoint. So, so if, if you took a masa, you probably don't need to take a restricted trace, but if you take a, a general sub von Neumann algebra, maybe you do, you know, so, so um, you just, you kind of need some structure uh, to, to get some of the results we have. But anyway, so you could, you could definitely define support expansion um, in a non-commutative setting. And I think uh, the results might be surprising. I don't, I don't know that you get exactly what, what I've done here. Um, I think you'd get some of the same conditions. I'm not sure they would be sufficient to give you all, uh, well, anyway, it's an interesting question. And then so all of this, like I say, is slotting into a much bigger theory of, of quantum uniform row algebras. Um, and so, so you kind of have, uh, the, the traditional theory of row algebras lives down here. So you look at commutative, and then you look at discrete, and then you have uniform row algebras, and, and th these are sort of on opposite ends of that. So, so you have things that come from metrics, and then you have our B sub bracket in is sort of as far from a metric as you can get. It, it doesn't care if things are close together, it just cares that there's not too many things in a row or a column, but they can be spread out. Um, and so, so this is sort of the classical uniform row algebra world here. Um, and then the things I've been talking about today uh, would be here. So we looked at in the not still commutative, but now non-atomic setting. And then we were able to sort of generalize. So here B sub bracket in is everything, right? That's why I didn't say support expansion there. That's the only support expansion row algebra you get, right? That's new. Um, but, but it splits here and you get a very rich post set. And this is sort of on the opposite end of what might be measurable metrics. And I don't think we've looked into this much, but you, I mean, measurable metrics exist under, under Nick's framework. And so I'm sure you'd get commutative non-atomic uh, uniform row algebras here. Um, and that would be dis probably somehow distant from what I'm doing, because what I'm doing with these support expansions don't care about how close things are. They just, they just care that nothing's blowing up too much. Um, and then, and then you have a whole other world in the non-commutative setting using uh, quantum relations to, to build core structures and, and uniform row algebras. And, and, and you can do support expansion there and you can do metrics. Next paper is largely about quantum metrics. Um, and, uh, and, so, and, and this is largely unexplored as well. Everything, everything over this non-commutative side, um, you definitely get C star algebras over here and we just haven't looked at them much. And it's it's not entirely clear what you get, um, but we do have some a couple of results that I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of question marks and unknowns, but we do have a couple of results that seem to imply that the structure of the underlying von Neumann algebras you're looking at might might affect the properties of the resulting C star algebra. So it, it seems like this is this probably doesn't just collapse into the one thing. Like this is probably a very rich setting, even when talking about like isomorphism and not just strict containment. Uh, 
so that's a lot. And, and if you don't know what a course structure is, then, then it, it's a little tough. Um, so I could talk about that now, but maybe, maybe going to questions early would be good. And, and then if, if it comes up, what is a course structure, then I can talk about that. Um, but I guess just parting right quick before I finish, uh, just, just a quick summary is, is support expansion is what I've worked with a lot. And, and especially in the community of non-atomic setting, you can really leverage um, composition operators to, to explore the post set. And that's what I've done, but, but that's, a, the, but I just want to emphasize that even though we get a lot of C star algebras, this is a very, very small little grouping out of a, a much larger story, right? There, there's, there's a lot to be done here. Um, and, and there's kind of, here's the classical setting and, and here's sort of what I've been exploring, but there's, there's still at least three big marks that, that we don't know very much about at all. Um, so there's, there's a lot to do. Okay, I, I think that's all I have to share. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks. Um, so question guys, if anyone has any questions? Um, so when you say measurable metrics, are you referring to like metric measure spaces or? Um, so, so you would you would you would take what Nick did for quantum quantum metrics and you would just specify to the co to the commutative setting. So so this would be um, I see collections of relations that satisfy axioms that make them a metric. Um, so these would be collections of measurable relations, um, which is which is a new thing and, and probably worth talking about. But um, I see. So it's different than like a metric measures. It's different than like a measure space with a metric on it that. I believe, yes, yes, it should be different. Do we have any other questions? Well, I guess if there's no other questions, then thanks a lot, Joe, to the great talk. And I will I will stop the recording here then.